Well, hello, and welcome to another episode of More Perfect Marketing. It's David Baer here, and today we're going to be talking about a topic that I I, I don't have a, a great deal of um, practical, personal uh, experience with, and and you know I, I like I like these topics a lot because usually I, I get to learn a lot uh, along uh, along with the uh, you know our, our listeners. We're going to talk about influencer marketing, and first of all, I, I want to say in influencer marketing is the current term for something that probably has existed for a very long time, but we we see it it it. it appears in a very different fashion these days because of the technology that has um, become central to the way that we communicate and exist in our world, um, mostly online. But long before any of these social media um, platforms existed, there were influencers in other mediums as well. And so um, we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about how influencer marketing works as a business, as a marketing channel, where it can and where it cannot be effective. And to help guide us through this conversation, I'm so very pleased to welcome Danielle Wiley, who runs the Sway Group, which is an agency focused very specifically on helping connect brands with influencers and building campaigns to affect their marketing. So Danielle, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. So, uh, okay, I I said at the top, I don't really know this subject very well. Yeah. I, I know it, it sort of from an academic point of view. And so I wonder if you can uh, help elaborate on what I what I sort of painted as a picture of this is this is a thing that's existed for a while. And obviously it exists in a very different form than it might have existed back in the, you know, in, in the 1950s. What is influencer marketing? Yeah, I think, I mean, part of why I founded Sway Group is I think because when social media influencer marketing kind of first began, marketers thought about it in that 1950s way. So back then, uh, most of the influencers were journalists. Um, of some kind, whether it was TV or print, and you could kind of use them, um, you could send out product if you wanted them to review something like, I don't know, I'm trying to think of an example, you have a new food product coming out, and you send it to the food columnist at a newspaper, and they try it, and they review it, and they talk about it, and you know, it's a very easy way to get the word out about something. And when blogs started coming up, and, and I'm saying blogs specifically, which we don't do a lot of blog work anymore, but that's where this all kind of started. Um, a lot of PR practitioners kind of thought of it in that old school way. And they would, I mean, I still remember sitting in the mid 2000s and sending out frozen bagels. <laughs> like I was working on a craft product called Bagel Folds, which is mm -hmm. basically like a and being from New York, it's a little bit painful to talk about, but they were basically like frozen bagel Twinkies. So it was like a tube bagel with the cream cheese in the middle and you got it from the freezer section. And we had a whole crew of interns just sitting in a room with dry ice, packing up bagelfuls and send them, sending them out to mom bloggers across yeah. the country. And the mom bloggers were super excited to get a box of bagelfuls and they tried them out and they wrote about them and we were like this is great and then we had a list of all these mom bloggers who love getting free products and we were like man this is making our job so easy this is terrific and then everything kind of came to a I don't know that it came to a halt but it slowly <laughs> dribbled down to a stop because I think there was a realization on both sides that influencers social media influencers are not Typical. There are some who might be more journalist-like, but really they're more spokespeople. They have their own platform. No one's paying them money to be writing each piece of work, much like a magazine writer would be paid for that. And these women were ending up with boxes and boxes of product <laughs> arriving at their house. And it there wasn't, there wasn't an ROI for them to keep writing about that all the time. So that was happening on the influencer side is that they didn't really want to be covering all of this stuff just for the price of a bagel Twinkie. Whereas on the agency and brand side, there was this realization of, you know what, this content's not always great. And I want them, I want to give them key messages and I want 
them to share things in a certain way. And I don't want them to talk about my competitor. And it kind of became clear, at least to my team, that these influencers were more like spokespeople and less like journalists. Mm. And the way that spokespeople work, as we all know, is you you pay them money and you give them key messages and they go out and they share them and you can kind of review that messaging and they get paid for doing things in a certain way. And that's where influencer marketing, social media influencer marketing kind of came of age and be- became what we know it as today. Although now we have TikTok and Insta is very different looking now than it was 11, 12 years ago, but that's kind of how it developed all right there, there's there were so many things in there and and the very first thing that i thought of um as as a fellow native new yorker is uh, uh i i never heard of bagelfuls but now that i've looked them up they they don't look very appetizing and i also remember um thinking the very new york sounding but not very new york tasting lenders bagels yeah um also <laughs> were very similarly not that appetizing um but th- but you know that's that's a podcast episode for another day i um I, i'm thinking about how we've now in in this current iteration and you're talking about tiktok and and some of the other you know more popular or or more uh, talked about platforms yeah. these days um have given an opportunity to uh, create this new type of spokesperson, right? It used to be a celebrity who we would all know, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, Suzanne Summers, Thigh Master commercials or those sorts of things where you would would, uh, take a celebrity who was famous for doing something else and engage them as a spokesperson. But these days, a lot of the influencer celebrity are people who have become celebrities because they have positioned themselves as influencers, which is the form of celebrity they are, right? Right. Um, and and we call this, I guess we call these creators or content creators or something. And I wonder if you can speak a little bit to, you know, what you've seen over the the period of time that, that you've watched this development, um, where this, uh, you know, came from, where you think it's going and, and where you, where you think it, it, is and isn't effective for the types of marketing opportunities that exist. I mean, when it when it first started, most of the people who started publishing content online, as I said, were bloggers and typically, uh, and I actually was one of them, and, and typically the reason you would start a blog is because you had something you wanted to share. You wanted to put something, cre- in my case, I was a food writer and I also had a day job and didn't have time to be pitching editors and trying to get my work out there, but I loved writing about food and I realized food blogging was a thing and it was a way to kind of keep my creative juices flowing without having all the work of pitching people and getting projections and all the like. Um, And so it really was just a creative outlet and then also a community, a way for other people to connect with each other. There's a lot of stuff has been written online about the early mom bloggers and how they were, you know, really isolated and at home with babies. Being a new mom is very, very difficult. And this was a way for them to find others going through the same thing and kind of get that real world story of what's going on and be able to connect with them. So that's where it really started. And then in about 2006 or so, ads started appearing, like ads became a thing on blogs and it became clear that there was monetization available both through banner ads and then eventually through sponsorships, which is what we do a lot of now. So sponsored content, someone writing a post or creating a a video that's sponsored by a brand. Um, So, I mean, the big difference from early days and now is the fact that early days it was started because people wanted to share something creatively. And now certainly you have people who are creative and want to share something. But if you ask any kid who wants to be a creator or an influencer now, it's because they want to make a lot of money. And and that wasn't kind of, I mean, I sound like an old fuddy-duddy now, but that wasn't the origins of it in the first place. So that I think is the big difference. And then just technology is so different now. So certainly 
the platforms that exist now didn't exist then, but just the way that content is shared and absorbed is so different in 2022, 2023 than it was back in the early days. Short form video is really everything now. That's that's what we see on TikTok. Instagram has it now with Reels. YouTube just announced YouTube Shorts, which is their competitor to TikTok. Um, people really want to absorb this content in short, visual, very dynamic with music and movement, short form video. So it's a really just the way that content is created and shared out is very different now than it was back then, too. And so the types of um, content that you're describing f- feels to me like it fits with certain types of brands or positioning and doesn't fit with others. I, I Like you, you've described these videos that I'm very proud to say I've never seen because, and, and you know what, I'm just being, uh, um, I, I'm being a, a fuddy duddy myself, right. Yeah. By, by intentionally saying, I, you know, I proud to say I don't have a TikTok account, but, and I, and I don't know that I've ever seen a, a video that's been generated for TikTok. Um, but at some point I'm going to have to, but, yeah. but, but, but this also speaks to the fact that there's a lot of the population who is not necessarily being reached by this type of popular form right now. And right. so I, I, I guess let's work backwards from that and talk about what types of brands or messages or, uh, uh, campaigns are most appropriate given the more popular format for influencer content these yeah. days? I mean, I think one of the big things to start with is that often people are surprised by who actually is on TikTok. So you might think it's, I have a 21 year old and a 17 year old, and they are kind of like who you think of when you think of who's on TikTok. In reality, the most popular demographic on TikTok are female millennials and many millennials are moms. So it is a bit older. Boomer content is incredibly popular Mm -hmm. on TikTok, believe it or not. Um, And then these short form videos also exist on Instagram and on YouTube. A lot of people are using YouTube now for their TV and YouTube shorts in particular. YouTube has said that they want people to be watching them on their big screen TV in their living room, not necessarily on their phone. Um, I just had a conversation with a technology company on Monday, and he has a new technology where you can take TikTok or Instagram content and turn it into a commercial that will run on Roku or any connected Mm. TV. So I do think people are going to start to see this content, even if they aren't spending their days, like my son laying on the couch, just scrolling endlessly through TikTok. Um, I think the other thing to talk about is there is so much different content up there and you would be surprised as to what resonates. We, one of the most successful TikTok campaigns we did this year was for lint rollers, which you wouldn't think would be super compelling or lend itself to dance moves or funny content, but we had terrific success with that. I'm happy to send you some examples of of that content that went live but it was funny and engaging and and actually performed we got great engagement on that content Um, but there's all sorts of there's doctors on there there's financial advisors on tiktok a lot of people are getting career advice on there there's lawyers sharing like you know fine print stuff that you might not know about ways that you can make sure you don't get taken advantage of so i think I'd be hard pressed to find a brand where it completely wouldn't work at all. You just have to kind of, it's huge. So you really have to find the right community and it might not be the best fit. Like there, there are certainly other platforms out there and other ways to do marketing. But I think the first thing I would say is you might be surprised in terms of what, what resonates and what doesn't. Well, and that's, I think, useful advice because one of the, the, you know, things that we, will advocate to a business that's trying to get their message in front of an audience is go where, where your audience exists. And clearly the audience is much broader than I, I might have suggested, but also go where your competition isn't also showing up. Right. So, right. um, and you know, uh, if you think, if you think about, um, 
the the concept that Dan Kennedy uh, talks about uh, out of category advertising, out of category marketing. Uh, a great example that he used to talk about all the time was chiropractors would run ads in the mattress section of the yellow pages, right? So I, I think to to a certain extent, the the fact that you know um, an attorney or a financial advisor showing up on TikTok giving advice is probably a great place for them to show up as long as they know how to get in front of their audience on that platform. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And there's, I mean, there's lots of tips that you can find um, online. Um, the algorithms change all the time. The big thing this year, at least like good advice for at least the time being is both TikTok and Instagram love a, a face talking at them. So not a video of something else happening, but really like a first person video of you talking or sharing something, or, I mean, it doesn't have to be a silly dance. It can really just be, I have a friend who gives career, she's a like a career coach for mm -hmm. young professionals. And she does a lot of her TikTok videos on her walk. So she just puts her AirPods in and has her phone held up and just talks and gives advice as she's walking through her neighborhood and they perform incredibly well. Well, that, that, that brings something uh, um, up that I, I'm curious about having not consumed a lot of this stuff. Although, you know, I'm, I'm watching the, uh, um, the video on the front of your website right now. And I see the, the, uh, the lint, you know, rollers, the and, rollers. And, and several of the other things <laughs> yeah. that there's a mix of high and low production value or quality which yeah. I, I imagine from your perspective as as the agency helping connect the the messenger with the the, the recipient, that there's some intentional, you know, um, consideration about what is what do we want this to look like for the and, audience? Yeah. And it really depends what the what this product or service is. So, for example, we used to work with a psychic network. The videos that worked best for them were was someone just talking about the experience that they had with the psychic, very low budget looking production. Just here's what happened. This was really interesting to me. I kind of was surprised by everything the psychic said, yada, yada, yada. On the other hand, you have clients like that lint roller client or someone else who's maybe more of like a consumer package good. And not only do they want that video to reach the audience of the influencer, but they want to be able to use it for their own purposes or right. repurpose that content. And so they want something that's a little bit more higher production. I mean, sometimes it depends what your what you want to use that content for and how like how many legs you want it to have and, and just the type of emotional connection that you want consumers to have. Like, consumers are not going to have an emotional connection with a lint roller the way that you want them to have an emotional connection with a tarot card mm -hmm. reader. Okay, okay. Can you speak to the, how many legs you want that, that content to have? Cause I'm curious, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, we, we talk about content repurposing sometimes. Yeah. How, how do you, how does that play out in your world? So that's changed quite a bit, especially over the last year or two, because um, creators slash influencers have gotten kind of savvy to the term usage and have realized that they can charge more for it. Um, so whereas back in the day, I'm talking like three years ago, you could give, like clients would get the right to use content in, perpetu in perpetuity as long as they were attributing the original creator of it. Mm. Now influencers are really charging a bit more for that. But typically we'll have clients, they'll pay for the rights to use that content in their advertising or on their website or wherever for anywhere from six months to a year, um, just depending on how much that costs and what they want to use it for. But using it for digital ads, using it, like I just mentioned, now you can use it on connected TV, um, putting it in newsletters, using it as during the pandemic, we had a lot of clients who couldn't do the photo shoots that they were typically doing. So they would pay extra to be able to fully own certain pieces of photographic content outright because they needed pictures for their website and they they couldn't, it was too difficult to pull together a photo yeah. shoot mid COVID. You're bringing up an interesting thing about either, uh, you know, extended use of content, and I'm thinking about, you know, all all the traditional forms of, uh, uh, you know, like in, in the film business, somebody uh, it works on a movie and it has a future life and, and you 
have some people who contractually get royalties or today we're talking about um you, you know this this world that i also don't understand non-fungible tokens and the abil- ability to track you know the use of something and continue to get paid for it into the future as well um with every time there's a transaction around it so i i, I imagine that there's going to be you know some uh, incorporation of those concepts more broadly with with influencer marketing in the future. Yeah, there's been a lot of talk about trying to use the blockchain to better track this content so that creators can get compensated fairly, especially when content's used longer. We're not quite there yet. So right now it's really like, okay, hey, you can you're paying to use this for six months and after that you have to stop and it's whether someone notices that they're mm-hmm. still using it seven months from now and didn't take it down. But um, yeah, especially on like Pinterest is a good example of this. So all of their traffic on Pinterest are images and graphics that folks have uploaded. And Pinterest is making a lot of money off of that stuff that people have uploaded for free. Um, There's been some talk about like, could you embed some kind, some piece of blockchain technology so that the original creator of that piece of content can get a portion of the ad revenue that Pinterest is making yeah. off of that. It gets very complex very quickly, um, but I think we'll see a lot of that technology developing over time. It, it, it makes me pine for the days when there were three you know, broadcast networks and the yellow pages and that was it, but um, yeah. <laughs> but I don't think we're going back there, I'm afraid. Um, the, okay, I, I want to talk a little bit about where um the type of influencer marketing that we've been talking about really fits best and and i i want to ask the the question through this lens um very often when we encounter the the local business the small business um they will say something to a marketing agency and and my my customers are marketing agencies um and so we hear stories all the time about you know a, a business owner saying, I tried that influencer marketing, Facebook ads, you know, Google my business, whatever, and it doesn't work. Or, mm-hmm. you know, my my nephew Timmy told me I need to be on TikTok or I paid an influencer for a shout out and nothing happened. And so I wonder if you can sort of talk about how who should be doing this the right approach, what are the steps, what are the considerations about utilizing the channel of influencers for a business? And obviously, there's certain types of businesses where it's going to be um, more obvious and more effective than others. And and what's what's the expected outcome? I mean, a, am I expecting sales on the back end or am I expecting traffic or awareness or what? Yeah, I think there's excuse me, I think there's two pieces to this. So one is where does influencer fit in the marketing funnel? And is this going to accomplish what I want? So to address that one first, typically influencer has been more top of funnel. So it's really been about awareness and then engagement if you're doing a good job at it, but not necessarily for that direct response right away purchase. That said, technology is now changing. And while not every influencer is, it's a very special, I almost call them like unicorns. It's Mm -hmm. a very special influencer who can encourage someone to click instantly on something. That said, we now can track that. So I think we're getting a lot better at identifying who those people are. And the fact that we can track through to purchase now with like uh, shoppable technology where someone shares a recipe and you can just click a button and all the ingredients go into your Instacart yeah. cart. Um, there's there's really cool ways to track that now, which gives us more control over it and allows influencer to kind of move further down that funnel. Mm-hmm. That said, I, I would still kind of think of it more as top to mid, okay. just for the purposes of not getting too hung up on, I need this many sales to come out of this expenditure because it's probably a recipe for disaster. Um, And then in terms of who should be, I'm trying to think the other part of your question. So. Yeah. So I, uh, let me, let me maybe follow up with what you were just talking about for a moment, because as, as I'm looking through 
case studies on, on the Sway Group website, I'm seeing the types of stuff that are very much top of funnel activities, right? Yeah, impressions, um, engagement. And and the the sort of the last thing and and um you you obviously any business could track beyond this. And and so I'm sort of curious, you know, what what anecdotal knowledge do you have because there's there's you know not not any data listed here, but the the last piece of um of data that you share typically on a lot of these is the traffic to the website, right? Mm -hmm. And so understanding that there's going to be multiple touch points for a business after that traffic comes to the website before there's a sales conversion or there's a conversion of some other sort, lead capture, et cetera. Um, I'm curious to sort of understand where in, in your experience, influencer marketing that gets traffic to someplace falls into the, the the greater mix and what it works best alongside. Yeah. So you are right that most clients do have more of that data. So we send the traffic to the website or to the landing page or to the Apple store to download an app. And then our knowledge typically ends at that point in terms of what happens. We do know with some clients, like we have a really big brand direct client who had a goal of app downloads this past year. They will not share with us how many they got, but they're increasing their budget for next year and have said they're very happy. So that's typically like the limits of what we get. And Mm -hmm. there are a number of business reasons as to why they're closed mouth like that, or we, many of our clients, most of our clients are like, we kind of lose sight of what happens once we send that traffic off. Um, I think, I mean, I wouldn't, it's, it's tricky as a small business to invest in this because you're right. It is more tough and mid funnel. And as a small business myself, it's scary to spend thousands of dollars and to not, be able to exactly pinpoint what that ROI is or know that you are paying money and you're putting this content out there and it's part of a much longer term play where it's just one of six to eight touch points and you're not exactly sure when that eighth one's going to happen and someone's going to click to buy. So I think for a very small business, I don't know that I would recommend something paid right away. That said, there's a lot that can be done with influencers and creators that's unpaid, depending on what kind of product or service you have. I I was just on a networking meeting yesterday with other marketing agencies, and we were talking about starting with your happy clients and mm-hmm. customers and finding people who you already work with and who already use your product or service and might have a platform of their own and be willing to talk about you and share about you. And maybe you kick them like a little extra freebie or do something extra for them or send them a thank you. I think that's the easiest kind of most low risk way to start with it because most small to mid size, you know, or even to mid sized businesses don't have the budget to do this yeah. large. Well, scale. And I think to, to a certain extent, that's a great test for whether, yeah. whether this, this channel even makes sense. There's, there's uh, the affiliate route, which is probably another way that a lot of early bloggers, you know, were, were monetizing their blogs mm-hmm. um, to, to pay based on, you know, con- the conversions that, that come from, you know, that, that source, that influencer. And then you, uh, you I, I didn't read the piece, but uh, I saw on social media that you had some comments on barter as well. Is that is that a, a thing that you endorse or that you don't like, or is is it more complicated than that? <laughs> it's more complicated than that. I mean, we don't we don't do it just because we're for us we want to have a certain quality of content out there, and when you're not paying that influencer like with actual dollars, you have nothing to hold in leverage and you don't have control over the quality of that content or when it gets done. And that's just not where we want to play. That said, if you're doing this directly as a small business owner, I think it makes a ton, like, why not try doing that? And to your point, it's a great test. I have a friend who owns an outdoor furniture company and he had an influencer come to him and say, can you give me like a furniture set for my backyard? I have this many followers and I'll write about it. And he actually made a ton of sales off of the content that she posted. The trick is then finding that next unicorn. Cause like I said, not everyone is, is 
great at driving sales, but you can, if someone wants something from you, that's going to, even if you're not paying them a fee, it costs money to give them free furniture or give them, I don't know, a legal consultation or whatever it is that you're trading. You, that's still a business arrangement. You can ask for kind of proof of concept ahead of time. So have you done this before? Did you drive sales? How many sales did you drive? Can I see an example of that content? You can check to make sure that it fits fits with your aesthetics, that it makes that it it feels right to you, that you're happy with the quality of content and that it drove results. So there's things you can do to kind of lessen the risk a little bit if you're doing this on your own and without, you know, the advice of a larger agency. Yeah, Let, let's let's um, shift gears because we're we're just about out of time, and I want to make sure that we can talk a little bit about the the specific work that you do uh, yeah. at the Sway Group, and um, also mention that you 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 have your own podcast as well, The Art of Sway. And so, do you you want to take a, a a few minutes to to simply share a little bit about the the type of role that an agency can play in helping make these connections? Yeah, so we we work both with brands and with agencies, and they come to us either with a request for a year-long program or just even a specific campaign, launching a product, a limited time offer, that sort of thing. And we figure out what platforms they should be on, what type of influencer they want, how much advertising we want to put behind the amplification of that content. And we put that program together. We recruit the influencers from, we have a network of over 30,000. So we're able to pretty easily recruit folks for campaigns and we give them instructions. We check the work, we measure the work, we give our clients kind of a wrap up report at the end that has both qualitative and quantitative data in there. Um, So we kind of are with our clients every step of the way, putting those programs together for them. Um, And then, yeah, we just launched the Art of Sway in the fall, which was very exciting with something we've been talking about doing for a long time. But as you know, there's a lot of work (laughs) that goes into putting a podcast together. But we talk to all types of people, but all through the lens of influence. So we've talked to film directors to I just talked to a gaming influencer will be coming out next year, talked to a um, business, a local business owner here who grew um, a small deli into a $75 million business. So we talked to lots of different folks and kind of find that thread of influence throughout. I, I'm I'm particularly keen to hear you uh, interview Robert Cialdini on influence. He's, uh, as, as you may know, the godfather of influence and uh, uh, somebody who speaks uh, very well on the subject. So um, I'll, we'll, let's, let's see if we can get him on your show as well. Yeah, let's see. <laughs> Anyway, um, where where can folks find more about you? Um, you can find us at swaygroup.com. We all of our social is linked there, and all all those great case studies that you referenced while we were chatting. Brilliant, and that's uh, easy to spell: s w a y group dot com. Yep. Excellent. Well, Danielle Wiley, this has been a fabulous introduction for me, and hopefully some of our audience members okay. as well. To to what influencer marketing is all about and where it where it works and also i love i love a lot of those testing ideas that that we we ran through as well so thanks so much for helping us understand all this yeah thanks for having me it's great indeed folks if you know somebody who could benefit from listening to the conversation you just heard please by all means share it in the meantime my name is david bear and you have been listening to more perfect marketing we'll see you back here again real soon take care